Karen Stout with Cardiology, and it is my great pleasure to introduce today's Cardiology Grand Rounds speaker, Dr. Bessie Young. Um, Bessie and I actually go way back in some sort of peripheral ways, um, and Bessie is a variety of things. One of them is sort of unique. She's actually a Seattle area native who's also, we'll call it a UW lifer. Um, we look at her training trajectory. Aside from some years spent in undergrad at Pacific Lutheran University, undergrad, medical school, residency, fellowship in nephrology, and subsequent faculty appointments have all been at the University of Washington. So she's walked the walk of UW and has really made an impact in all the work she's done. So she's a nephrologist. She's currently the, or was the section chief of nephrology at the VA for many years physician scientist who's been a professor for quite a few years, um, lots of funding and funding for, in part, some of what she's going to talk about today, racial disparities in um, the treatment of um, renal disease. And she's also really stepped into the space of equity, diversity, and inclusion, and has done so initially with the Department of Medicine and now is the vice dean of equity, diversity, and inclusion for the School of Medicine, a position created um, both to meet the need and because of her unique skill set um, by the dean and vice dean and everybody else. So she is a vice dean for diversity, equity, inclusion, however, equity, diversity, inclusion, um, and does so the same work within the nephrology and renal treatment and clinical practice. So I think I have just a ton of respect for somebody who can bring together all of those things in their day-to-day -day work and really um, bring the dedication to the clinical care, the research, and then the service to the institution, um, which is lovely. And in the time that I've spent with Bessie, one of the things I've always really loved about her is just, she's got a really calming demeanor. And for those of us who are like over-caffeinated squirrels, it's really lovely to be around that. And the other thing is that the way she and I go back a long ways is actually her sister and I have been friends for decades. And so I've gotten the opportunity to always hear about Bessie. Her sister's not in medicine. And what I've gotten to hear about Bessie has always been, God, she does such great work. She's so accomplished. Just the pride her sister has in her, which is really cool. I did ask her sister from some, for some dirt or something like that. And, and sort of what I expected, there wasn't any, which is ever so sad. However, she did share something where during her residency, during some stretch of rotations, um, she was living with her sister. And I think emblematic of her dedication, but the dedication of all of us, the thing that stood out to her sister one day was coming home from whatever work she was doing and saying, we hadn't seen her for like a month and come in and she is face first on her bed, in her clo work clothes, with her car keys still clutched in her hand, having come home from whatever rotation and just done. And so she sort of woke her up and she looked at her, Bessie looks at her clock and is like, nope, I still got two hours to sleep. And just put her face right back down again, clutching her car keys. And I think that that is that dedication to what we do that we all carry in varying degrees, but I thought was a fairly endearing representation of the outside looking in to what it is we all do, and what Bessie in particular has really dedicated her, her professional career to. So with that, I'm really delighted to introduce Dr. Young, and I hope everybody enjoys her grand rounds. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, that was when I was a resident, or, or was I an intern, and I was coming home and just had to get as much sleep as I possibly could. <laughs> So, um, so I want to say thank you for having me, and um, I'm Bessie Young, as Karen said, and really I, I um, am excited to be here to share some of the work that I've been doing over the years. So um, I'm going to start with a statement that honors the land of which the University of Washington stands, and we acknowledge the land we occupy today as a traditional home of the Tulalip, Muckleshoot, Duwamish, and Suquamish, and Coast Salish tribal nations, and without them, we wouldn't have access to this healing, working, teaching, and learning environment. Um, and we humbly take this opportunity to uh, thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. Um, so I uh, moved from the VA to the Office of Healthcare Equity about 15 months ago, so about a year and a half. And um, my new office was started, established July 1st, 2020, to really address the sort of equity, diversity, and inclusion issues around UW Medicine. 
And so the vision is to deliver on the UW mission to improve the health of the public by ensuring policies and practices focus um, on equity, uh, societal and health justice as we strive to be an anti-racist institution. And we've gone through some strategic planning and we have a new Office of Healthcare Equity Blueprint that has these six sort of strategic areas that we're focusing on, which include leadership, strategic operations, workforce development, community engagement, research, quality improvement, and uh, the learning environment. And this is the team that I work with. Paula Houston is my boss. She's the chief equity officer. And I also work with Leo Morales, who's one of the assistant deans, Edwin Lindo, and Jonathan Cantor, who's a, a behavioral scientist, as well as Eric Ho and Lee Davis and Martin Pierre-Louis and Elaine Ocasio. So that's where I am right now. But before that, I was doing a lot of research in health disparities and kidney disease. So uh, the objectives of today are really to review the causes of health inequities and in chronic kidney disease or CKD in African Americans and Blacks. And I'll sort of go between African Americans and Blacks because the population I'm studying is really in the South and, and considered um, African American with African descent. Um, I'm going to review the link between apolipoprotein L1 or ApoL1 and kidney disease. And I'm going to review the ethics of ApoL1 genetics and kidney disease. So this is a slide that you've all probably seen before, but it just sort of grounds me in that of all the forms of inequality injustice in healthcare is the most shocking um, and inhumane. And Martin Luther King made this statement about 50 years ago when he was speaking at a conference in Chicago um, on the, the Medical Committee for Human Rights, where he was really talking about um, segregation in a hospital at that time. And so we've come a long way, but there's still a ways that we have to go. Um, so just a little bit of background about kidney disease for the cardiology audience. So chronic kidney disease affects about 26 million Americans and African-Americans and Blacks have about a two to four times greater risk of development of kidney failure or end-stage renal disease or end-stage kidney disease compared to whites. And if you look at the dialysis units, about 32% uh, of dialysis units are African-American or Black, where, whereas African-Americans comprise about 12 to 13% of the population. And if you go to the South, it's, it's more like 80 to 90% of the dialysis patients are actually Black. Um, in those units because there's a higher, greater um, African-American or Black population. And we've sort of known this ever since we've started people on dialysis. And if you look at the incidence rates of end-stage kidney disease, you can see it's much greater in uh, Blacks or African-Americans compared to whites. But it's also high for some of the other um, underrepresented minorities or ethnic minorities, um, Native Americans, Asians, um, Latin, Hispanics, and um, compared to, to whites. If you look over time, the incidence rate um, per million by race in the U.S. population has always been a little bit higher for uh, African Americans compared to others. Um, and there was a, a decrease in that for Native Americans or American um, Alaska Natives um, because of uh, just Thank you. <laughs> so there was a, a decrease for um, Alaska Native and American Indians because uh, there was really a focus on trying to uh, work on the risk factors of diabetic nephropathy. And it really decreased the incidence, and this was through the Indian um, Health Service. Um, uh, and if you look at the cumulative uh, lifetime incidence of end-stage renal disease uh, by race and ethnicity, you can see that African Americans start like 10 years earlier and then just have this incredibly high uh, cumulative lifetime incidence of end-stage renal disease. So this is the graph for men. It's a similar graph for, for women. Um, and uh, just to really emphasize the fact that this is a disease that really uh, disproportionately affects African Americans. So why is this? And I've sort of spent my career trying to figure this out. Um, and so we've come to, you know, a lot of things are due to these social determinants of health. And social determinants of health are sort of the range of personal and social, economic and environmental factors that influence health status um, and are, are really things that um, can be changed, but they include education and access to quality care, healthcare access um, and the quality of that care, the neighborhood and the built environment, social and co the community context and, um, uh, and economic stability. So 
these are all things that really factor into kidney disease, but they factor into many other diseases as well. Um, and Yoshio Hall, who's now the section head of nephrology over at the VA, came up with this conceptual model of social determinants of health and kidney disease, um, and sort of uh, looked at socioeconomic position, uh, social class, all can affect um, how you're educated and what your occupation is, which can affect your income. And those can have effects on your material conditions, such as your ability to get food, your ability to get housing, and then other biologic factors and, and also psychological factors. And these have sort of an effect on your, um, whether or not you develop chronic diseases such as obesity and hypertension and diabetes, which are all risk, risk factors for kidney disease. Um, so um, that is one model of social determinants of, of health and kidney disease, but it's also something that we see in cardiology. And this is a recent article that was just published uh, uh, two days ago, which is uh, racial inequities and in access to uh, ventri ventri ventricular assist devices and transplant. And it showed that uh, black patients compared to white were 55% less likely to receive a BAD or heart transplant um, in this uh, observational study. And just, just to show that, um, you know, doesn't matter whether it's kidney disease or, or heart disease. Um, I think that social determinants of health and probably systemic and institutional racism may have an effect on whether people get access to procedures like transplants or uh, to sort of life-saving procedures as well. So, um, so I'm going to talk no, more about risk factors for kidney disease, and we'll go through some of the findings of uh, that we found over the years and end up with a genetic diseases that are associated, genetic findings that are associated with kidney disease. So some of the typical risk factors for kidney disease include hypertension, diabetes, whether or not somebody has a family history of kidney disease, smoking, poverty, and cardiovascular disease. And we'll go through some of those findings. So um, when I was doing more uh, sort of uh, research, uh, I, I was able to get a grant that looked at the Jackson Heart Study, uh, which is a study, a large prospective NIH-funded study of cardiovascular disease in African Americans. And the study involves um, 5,306 African Americans in Jackson, Mississippi. They collected three exams um, from those different data points, 2000 to 2004, 2005 to 2008, 2009 to 2012. And then there's a, the more recent exam was just funded in 2021. So they're now collecting data and we received a grant to really develop a kidney disease working group. And so initially um, the clinical exams um, went to 2012 and the, the outcomes were really card cardiovascular disease, stroke and heart failure. And so we extended that to look at kidney disease. Um, and so one of the first papers that we really uh, focused on was identifying factors for rapid kidney function decline among African-Americans. And this is the Jackson Heart Study subjects, uh, 5,301. We had to exclude people who were missing creatinine either at the first visit or the last visit. Um, and include, so we included subjects of about 3,653 subjects for all of the, the data that I'm going to show you. Um, so this is the group, the whole co cohort of 5,300 versus our analysis cohort of 3,600 uh, participants. And you can see the age is um, relatively young for a cohort, 54 to 55 years old. It's majority female um, and also majority sort of higher income, uh, higher education. So only 16 to 20% had uh, education less than high school. Most of them had private insurance and um, only about 20% had diabetes. Many had hypertension at entry into the study. Um, and not many had kidney disease. So about 10 to 11% had kidney disease at baseline. Um, so when we looked at risk factors for rapid kidney function decline, which was a EGFR decline of greater than 30% over 10 years, what we found is that age in 10 year increments was associated with this rapid decline. Low income was associated with a twofold greater uh, odds of rapid kidney function decline, as well as um, a lower education, higher systolic blood pressure, diabetes, and smoking, and prevalent cardiovascular disease. So we'll go through some of those factors and, and look at them in a little bit more detail um, and focus in on um, some other findings that we had. So what we concluded is that chronic kidney disease was prevalent in this, this group. Um, risk factors for rapid kidney function declined in, included socioeconomic status, age, diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease, and smoking. 
and BMI and, and increased waist circumference, which I didn't show, were not associated risk factors. So we worked with many people across the country, and there was a cardiologist at um, Jackson at um, University of Mississippi who was very interested in smoking and had done some work on cardiovascular disease and smoking, and so wanted to look at smoking and, and kidney disease because it really hadn't been shown that it was associated with renal disease. So um, smoking, as you know, is associated with lung cancer and increased risk of heart disease, and it's routinely uh, recommended as a preventative measure uh, but before our, our paper, no one had consistently associated kidney disease with, um, heart, with smoking. Uh, so what he found is that when he looked at change in estimated GFR um, from exam one to exam three, um, he found that there was a 12 um, millimeter uh, per minute uh, per, per millimeter per minute per 1.73 meters squared decrease in eGFR for those who were current smokers and um, it was a slightly less for past smokers and definitely less for those who never smoked. And when you when he compared um, whether or not cigarette, the number of cigarettes someone smoked um, made a difference, there was a, a little bit of a um, dose response. So those who smoked more cigarettes had the highest risk of uh, rapid kidney function decline. So he was able to show that cigarette smoking was definitely a risk factor, sort of confirming what we had found in that original study. We also looked at whether or not uh, beverage patterns influence the risk of incident kidney disease. So Casey Rebholtz is an epidemiologist at Johns Hopkins who was interested in um, sweetened drinks and soda. And, and what she looked at uh, using the Jackson Heart data um, was that um, if you adjusted for all those uh, factors like exercise and age and gender, education, BMI, smoking, physical activity, hypertension and diabetes, um, soda or sweetened fruit drinks was associated with a 61% higher risk of uh, rapid kidney or incident kidney disease. And so, again, this is another social determinant of health. It's some, something that people ingest that can be changed that's associated with incident kidney disease. Sort of moving on to some of the other risk factors, this is a study that uh, Nisha Bonsal, who's here at uh, UW, who is very interested in heart failure, she wanted to look at whether or not uh, kidney disease was associated with uh, heart failure or heart disease or stroke. And what she showed here is that um, if you had kidney disease, um, you had almost twice uh, the, the incidence of heart failure, heart disease, and stroke um, in a study that looked at um, the Jackson Heart Study, um, MESA, and um, uh, uh, the Coronary Heart Study, the Cardiovascular Health Study. Um, and when we, when she looked specifically at whether or not there was a difference by race and ethnicity, what she showed is that those who were black who had kidney disease had a higher risk of heart failure compared to those who didn't. And, and if you looked at data from the Jackson Heart Study, there was a, a highly significant increased risk of heart failure in that uh, study compared to the cardiovascular health study and to MESA. So there are some, there's a higher incidence of heart failure that we definitely know affects African Americans and um, and this study really showed that uh, there's probably something there that needs to be further evaluated. Um, so going on to other dis diseases and risk factors for kidney disease. So diabetes is a uh, sort of the number one risk factor for kidney disease. It's a uh, 1.7 fold more likely to be diagnosed in uh, blacks than whites. Blacks are 2.5 times more likely to be diagnosed with end-stage kidney disease secondary to diabetes compared to whites, and blacks are 1.7 fold more likely to die as a result of diabetes. And as I said, diabetes is the primary cause of end-stage renal disease, and it's a powerful predictor for excess mortality. Um, so we evaluated the association between diabetes and kidney disease and the potential excess risk of incident stroke, heart disease, and CVD uh, mortality in the Jackson Heart Study. Um, so this is just to remind you about the trends in end-stage renal disease. Again, Blacks have this higher, much higher incidence of end-stage renal disease compared to all the other um, groups. Um, and again, disparities decrease over time for um, uh, Native Americans and American Indians, but not for Blacks. Um, so this is, this is data from uh, the Jackson Heart Study where um, Marianne F. Carrion looked at diabetes and sort of risk, risk of um, heart disease um, and heart disease outcomes. And so this just shows um, how the, the data sort of uh, played out for those with diabetes. So most of the 
most of the patients or most of the participants didn't have uh, they had didn't have kidney disease, um, and um, only 14% had uh, um, diabetes. So, um, or it's about 20% had diabetes, but many of the other uh, factors were similar. Um, so when she looked at incident stroke, those with diabetes um, were about two to threefold um, greater incident stroke, um, incident heart, coronary heart disease, there was a higher risk in those who had diabetes and mortality, there was a, a significantly higher risk in those who had diabetes. So she was very interested in looking at whether or not kidney disease was a similar risk factor um, compared with diabetes. So she compared those who, who didn't have diabetes uh, or kidney disease to those with diabetes, um, without kidney disease, those with diabetes, um, those only with kidney disease and those with diabetes and kidney disease. And what you can see from this uh, sort of chart here is that if you have diabetes and kidney disease, your risk of incident stroke and incident um, heart disease is, is significantly higher um, compared to those who just have either diabetes or kidney disease. And diabetes and kidney disease are, appear to be sort of similar risk for um, coronary artery disease or stroke. Um, so very, very interesting data there. So um, we'll keep going and looking at different risk factors for kidney disease and now sort of uh, looking at um, genetic diseases associated with kidney disease. And here I'm going to switch and talk a little bit about APOL1, which is something that I've been interested in and tell you the story of APOL1. So um, there was a paper that was published in 2010 that showed the association of uh, trypanolytic APOL1 or apolipoprotein L1 variants with kidney disease in African-Americans. And just to give you a little bit of history of that, so, um, Tri it starts with the story of trypanosomes, and trypanosomes are parasites uh, that are endemic to Africa, and they're transferred from the gut of a tsetse fly to humans after a bite. They live inside and multiply, and then they can cross the blood-brain barrier to cause African sleeping sickness. And this is a sort of a photomicrograph of trypanosomes and red blood cells, um, and the trypanosomes are in blue. Um, and so apolipoprotein L1 is, uh, has genetic variants that are associated with protection from uh, Af African sleeping sickness or trypanosomes. And we think that these variants arose about 3,000 to 6,000 years ago in Africa um, and are associated with resistance to the lethal form of African sleep sleeping si sickness. That's a tsetse fly who's just getting ready to, to bite someone. <laughs> um, so these variants uh, that are protective are seen only um, in people of African descent, and it's, it's probably West African descent. And someone is considered at high risk of kidney failure if they have two of these risk variants. And so I'll go through some of that data. So these APOL1 variants um, are associated with non-diabetic kidney disease, and there are two variants. One is called G1. It has two amino, amino acid substitutions. And G2 has two amino acid uh, base pair deletions that are shown there. G1 uh, is present in about 40% of Yoruba um, from Nigeria and West Africa. And this is from a cohort called the HapMap um, that wasn't present in either Europeans or Japanese or Chinese who are part of this study. Um, and it's thought that about 30% of African-Americans have either G1 or G2 or both G1 and G2. And we think that about 13 to 14% of African Americans have both G1 and G2, which puts them at very high risk for these, um, these APOL1 variants, which puts them at risk for kidney disease. Um, so the variants can cause trypanosome lysis. And so uh, the, the top uh, trypanosome is the wild type trypanosome. So APOL1 is sort of that blue um, uh, molecule there and it can attach to the lysosome and acts as a channel and can cause swelling, which then sort of uh, lyses the trypanosome. So the trypanosome, some of the trypanosomes have developed a defense called the uh, serum uh, reactive antigen protein or SRA, um, and that can bind to APOL1 and can prevent the lysosomal swelling. Um, but um, these variants can also um, attached to lysosomes and then cause the swelling, which can uh, lyse the trypanosome. So that's the mechanism that people think is active in sort of the protection from uh, African sleeping sickness. 
The distribution of G1 and G2 across Africa shows that most of these variants, uh, G1 in blue, G, G2 in green, and the wild type in red, and I apologize if people can't see those colors, but um, so most of the G1 and G2 variants come from West Africa, and uh, that's where we think that uh, these uh, variants came to uh, America through probably the slave trade. Um, so most of the, the enslaved population came from West Africa, and so we think that that's uh, where those variants came from. There are fewer of, of those variants in East Africa and, and probably none in some of the higher East African countries and just a few in South Africa. Um, and this is a, a sort of a cartoon that shows the structure of APOL1. Um, and so if you have um, the wild type, you're susceptible to trypanosomiasis. If you have one risk allele, you're thought to have a hetero heterogeneous advantage to trypanosomiasis. Tri and if you have two of the risk variants, then you actually de can develop um, what we think is APOL1 nephropathy um, but you're protected from African sleeping sickness. Um, so when this, this finding was first um, published, folks then started to go through a lot of the data to see if they can find uh, this variant in different diseases. So um, some of the initial papers were case control studies where they looked at focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, which is one cause of kidney disease and showed that if people had APOL1, the high-risk variants, there was a tenfold greater risk of end-stage renal disease. Um, they looked at hypertensive-associated uh, kidney disease and found that if you had the APOL1 variants, high-risk variants, it was associated with a sevenfold greater risk of end-stage renal disease. And if you had HIV um, nephropathy, there was a 29-fold greater risk of end-stage kidney disease that you can see there. And there are also some studies in, in those who are being transplanted that show that if you receive a kidney from someone who's had ABOL1, there's a slightly decreased um, survival of that transplant. So it's really uh, sort of affected how we look at ABOL, um, how we look at kidney disease. And, and now nephrologists are really looking at ABOL1 for lots of different diseases. Um, so again, a, a lot of the studies that were then published looked at APOL1 high-risk genotypes and, and whether or not they were associated with kidney disease um, decreased function over time. This is a study by PARSA in the New England Journal that showed that if you had zero copies of APOL1 risk variants or one copy um, that compared to those who had two copies, there was a definite decrease in kidney function over time. And, in, and the decline was greatest in those who had the high-risk genotypes. Um, this is a, a graph that really shows the odds of kidney disease in individuals with two ABOL1 risk variants, G1, G1, G1 or G2, and G2, G2 among different studies. So initially, those uh, the case control studies, which were the original studies, showed these very high odds ratios because we were comparing cases to controls. But then as we started to, as um, folks started to do more studies and population-based cohorts, you could see that the odds decrease because you were comparing in sort of the general population. So now we think if someone has an APOL1 risk variant, it's probably about a twofold greater risk of developing in stage kidney disease as opposed to like seven to tenfold, but it really depends. And so there's still more research um, sort of ongoing in that regard. So papers on APOL1 have been increasing since 2010, um, and they're, they're still increasing. And now people are looking at what the mechanism is because it wasn't clear. There are, are some medications that are being developed, but um, again, it really depended on the basic science and the mechanisms. Um, and then just, again, some of these papers that showed that the APOL1 variants in, uh, uh, had lower survival. So. If you had the two risk alleles, then um, there was definitely less kidney survival um, in years of follow-up in some of these larger cohort studies. If you, and this was a study by Carmen Peralta, who looked at when people developed in stage renal disease. So if you had, if you were black and you had the high risk variant, you just developed albuminuria earlier and your rate of decline of kidney uh, function was much faster than compared to those who were low risk and those who were white. Um, who, who don't have this variation. Um, and it also uh, was shown in kids. So this is a study from CKID and um, the Neptune studies uh, that look at children who have kidney disease and showed that if you had the, they had the APOL1 uh, high-risk high variants, uh, there was a lower EGFR and more rapid uh, kidney function decline. So on the y-axis is change in um, 
per year in EGFR here in, and uh, these are just EGFR um, studies. So this is April 1 high risk variants versus April 01 one low risk variants, and if you had the high risk, if they had the high risk variants, then their EGFR declined faster. And this was from CKID and from the Neptune study. So um, I think I have one more slide here about the April 1 genotypes. And this was the study by Barry Friedman that showed that April 1 variant in, uh, variants in kidneys were associated with a 2.26 fold greater risk of transplant failure uh, if you looked at them compared to those who didn't have the high risk variants. And um, again, this just shows some of the um, risk of kidney failure or rejection uh, by zero versus one and two variants. And so we, we actually looked at this in the Jackson Heart Study because it wasn't clear to me that if you had one allele, did you have a higher risk of kidney failure versus having the two alleles? And um, our study, I think, wasn't didn't, didn't have enough participants, but did, didn't show that if you had one allele that you had a higher risk of kidney disease. And so in the study of all African-Americans, it showed that if you had um, the high risk variation of APOL1, you had high, a greater risk of albuminuria, incident dialysis that was ninefold greater, and incident chronic kidney disease of 1.6-fold greater, and a, a rapid decline of EGFR of twofold. Um, and then uh, we were part of a study that looked at whether or not APOL1 uh, high-risk variants were, was associated with cardiovascular disease. And this was a study where they combined a lot of the studies um, where APOL1 variants, variants were present or were measured, uh, about 21,000 uh, participants, and found that there wasn't really a risk of increased cardiovascular disease in people who had the high-risk APOL1 variants. Um, so we know that it's really associated with kidney disease, um, and so I think um, that these genotypes are associated with decreased kidney function over time. Um, the decline of kidney function inc is increased after the onset of albuminuria. Um, it's really greatest in those with the two high-risk variants, and even children with these high-risk genotypes and kidney disease have a faster decline in their kidney function. So um, I uh, sort of switched a little bit in terms of what I started to look at and wanted to really look at the ethics of genetic testing because this was a new finding, new for us in nephrology. Um, so I, I teamed up with Wiley Burke, who's a geneticist, to really think, start thinking about the ethics of genetic testing in different populations. And so I, I show this picture. I don't know if people know what this is, um, and anyone can call out if you... There you go. <laughs> yeah, so um, so I always put this up because it really is, um, to me, and, and I think there's actually a little bit of controversy about this, that this really created this legacy of mistrust in uh, sort of the medical community for the African-American community. Um, there's also a little bit of distrust in the African-American community because of sickle cell testing that we did um, back in the 70s, where we had programs where we would test for sickle cell disease. And if people had sickle cell disease, they actually might not be able to get a job or couldn't get insurance. So there's a lot of mistrust there. And then in, in terms of just general um, genetic diseases and nephrology, there's polycystic kidney disease, where when I was a fellow, we had this policy of don't ask, don't tell, because we would actually like diagnose polycystic kidney disease by ultrasound. Um, and the, the folks would ask, well, should I get my children tested? And it's like, well, no, because then they'll have a pre-existing disease and they might not be able to get insurance. So um, we were hoping that would change with the, the onset of the, you know Ob Obamacare so that everybody has uh, insurance, um, but I think it's still an issue. So um, so there's this history of uh, you know what to do with genetic tests and the results of those tests. Um, and what is the right way to start genetic testing? So this was a new variation um, that um, was clearly associated with kidney disease. Uh, people started to say, well, we then should screen everybody um, because this is something that is associated with kidney failure. Uh, but then the questions were, who has access to that information? How long is that information kept? Um, what if we find out a disease that we thought wasn't associated with anything now becomes associated with something like sickle cell trait, which is associated with kidney disease? Um, and do people have a right to know whether or not they were screened for something as a child? And, and is, are those data available? So we uh, started a 
um, uh, we wrote a grant, um, a community-based evaluation of APOL1 genetic testing in African-Americans. And the aims were to conduct um, interviews to determine views about uh, providing APOL1 results to research participants and patients receiving clinical care. Um, we also wanted to conduct community-based group discussions or town halls to, to get at what people, what the community wanted and what their preferences were. And we also uh, convened a national meeting of stakeholders to review the current science on APOL1 related kidney disease and develop guidelines for policymakers. And at the UW, um, I teamed up with several of the bioethicists, um, Wiley Burke, Malia Fullerton, Erica Blackshear, Clarence Bigner, who's one of the health uh, services uh, professors, and Jonathan Himmelfarb, who uh, used to be the director of the Kidney Research Institute and um, directs the, the diabetes or the Kidney Disease uh, Center. Um, we teamed up with the folks at Vanderbilt and University of Mississippi. And what we found, and I'll go through these data, is that um, people really did want to know. We had three sites, um, which I'll go through. We did interviews, um, we had a national meeting, and then we came up with recommendations, and we'll go through that. So we started out with these key informant interviews, which took about a year. We had community, community conversations, which took another year. And then we had a stakeholder meeting that we held in Bethesda with uh, lots of different uh, folks, uh, stakeholders that we invited. Um, our study locations were Seattle, Jackson, Mississippi, and Nashville, just uh, more for convenience. Um, and, and then we conducted about 75 stakeholder interviews that included clinicians, um, researchers, um, community members and patients, family, and, and just other um, members as well. Um, and um, when we asked uh, sort of questions about, should we offer APOL1 testing to all participants, irrespective of their other risk factors, the researchers in the group said, um, well, no, we shouldn't offer APOL1 testing um, because we don't really know how to treat it and we don't know that much about it. Um, nephrologists sort of agreed with him and said, no, we, we don't know how to treat it, so we really shouldn't start to offer testing, um, sort of mixed. The primary care providers were a little mis mixed. Patients were um, really wanted to have this testing done. And when we started to do these groups where we told them about it, a lot of them said, well, well how, why, are, why are we just hearing about this now? Why, didn't, why hasn't anyone told us about this before? Um, and that was a pretty consistent finding from patients and family members and other, other community members. Um, so as um, part of our April 1 community conversations, uh, there was a lot of uh, support for optional APOL1 testing and routine patient care and, and kidney transplantation. And one thing that one participant said is, we got to know, first thing I would do would be to live a healthier life, change my lifestyle, and maybe they will find a cure at some point or a better way to help us better. Um, so, the, so participants really wanted to know. Um, participants expressed a strong support for APOL1 testing in the transplant setting. Uh, so there was near uh, unanimous support for this type of testing um, and offering testing to potential living donors. And most participants really uh, opposed a policy of prohibiting living donors with high APOL1 risk from donating a kidney. And this was very important because what the transplant centers were already doing is that they were testing living donors. And if living donors had two to the high risk variants, they were not allowing them to donate a kidney. And what we heard from uh, the, the patients and the family members is that they really wanted to have that choice because maybe they wanted to give a kidney to someone in their family who they felt needed that kidney more than them. So they wanted to be part of that conversation. Um, but and, and this sort of led to a new study called the Apollo study, which is ongoing, where they're, we're actually following up on living related donors who, have, who may have APOL1. Um, our stakeholder meeting, which we held in uh, Bethesda, um, included our scientific advisory board and our community advisory board, which we um, had and had been communicating with throughout the study. Uh, we had uh, com our community deliberation participants, so, so uh, patients and family members from Seattle, Jackson, Mississippi, and Nashville were at this meeting. Uh, we had the NIH there. We had policymakers from the National Medical Association and CDC. We had other foundations there, so I included American Society of Nephrology, the National Kidney Foundation, American College of Physicians, and some of the patient groups, um, SGIM and American Kidney uh, Foundation. 
Um, we had other genetic organizations, so the American Society of Human Genetics and American College of Medical Genetics there. And some of the inclusions that we made from the stakeholder meeting included that African Americans and Blacks should be informed about APOL1 risk. Um, APOL1 testing should be integrated into renal transplant programs. Um, APOL1 testing is not recommended for routine clinical use or screening because there's no specific actions or treatments to improve outcomes for people with APOL1 kidney disease. And this may change because now there are some biologicals that, that companies have developed that are actually, uh, they think, may be able to treat APOL1 kidney disease. So that's ongoing, and there are going to be some new trials that really look at that. Um, research is needed for a better understanding of APOL1 risk and the mechanisms of kidney disease. And then really the involvement of members of the African-American or Black community in development of policies and educational materials are needed um, for APOL1 risk and APOL1 testing to really ensure that uh, the policies address community needs and preferences. Um, so um, this again just looks at what we uh, found um, that community members, researchers, and clinicians all supported the need for reliable information um, and sources of APOL1 for community members and clinicians, um, that we needed to offer APOL1 res results to um, in research to study participants, which is something that is ongoing um, now in different settings um, where we've done a lot of genetic testing, but we don't tell the per participants what their genetic test means. And so there's a push now to give participants and studies their genetic information. Um, the use of APOL1 testing in routine clinical care. So again, clinicians and researchers were generally negative and community members generally positive about the use of APOL1 in routine testing, uh, routine clinical care, um, and that um, APOL1 testing in kidney transplant programs, there was mixed reviews about APOL1 testing in kidney transplant programs. Um, so um, in in conclusion, um, health disparities in kidney disease exist. APOL1 is really a genetic variation that's associated with kidney disease in African Americans. APOL1 is associated with uh, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, high VAN, which is HIV um, associated nephropathy in African Americans, um, and probably a disease called APOL1 nephropathy. Um, there are ongoing studies to determine the, uh, the ethics around genetic testing for APOL1. Um, and in regard to APOL1 genetic testing, what we got from our community members is that our study reflected a positive interest um, and discussion about risk identification uh, that many researchers and clinicians didn't share, and that there's a need for both better evidence and substan substantive discussion between experts and the public before widespread screening moves forward. Um, and these are some of the quotes that we got from some of our participants. So. Um, the advantage of knowing in advance that there is a genetic abnormality could help the patient lead a better and healthier life to avoid the consequences of uh, anything else that could be could have been done to provoke kidney disease. Mm -hmm. And most patients would love to know that information so they can prevent disease. Um, that was from a primary care provider. Um, I think um, to me that goes along the lines of personalized medicine. So maybe it's based on genes and people should be treated different ways. So I think that this would be nothing but a plus. So this really speaks to what we're doing now in nephrology. We have a kidney precision medicine uh, where we're looking at um, basically single nephrons and trying to decide what genetic diseases are associated with um, or genetic or what the me mechanism for different disease is. Um, and we want to make sure that we're following the data and not jumping to conclusions about when to apply something that may still be in a phase of further interpretation in science. And that was from a nephrologist. So um, I think for this, we there's the promise that there's something that might be able to be treated. Um, and uh, we need a little bit more research in that area. Um, so I've mm -hmm. sort of come up with this um, framework that if you look at kidney disease and look at other sort of diseases, it really spans sort of like the social, biologic uh, versus environmental and genetic um, sort of interactions. And there are lots of social conditions that can affect someone's uh, development of disease and institutional sort of access to care, all of the social determinants of health. There's a social context, which are how, um, you know, people sort of what, what their diet is, are they um, exercising? 
uh, what their neighborhoods look like, also part of the social determinants of health, um, their demographics like age and um, socioeconomic status, um, education that can uh, really change somebody's individual risk, and then risk behaviors like tobacco, alcohol use, um, uh, and diet that can affect somebody's individual risk. And what I think we're really trying to integrate here are some of the biologic responses. So it, obesity, depression, stress, and diabetes, um, and how these affect the genetic pathways. So we, we don't know if there's a, like a two-hit model. Is there a biologic response that you have this underlying genetic disease, and then you develop uh, you know, kidney disease, as my example, because now you have hypertension and diabetes and all of these other risk factors that increase the risk of developing um, end-stage renal disease. Um, so I, I think that's all. I left a little bit of time for questions. Um, and thank you very much for, for having me. <laughs> So I'm not going to anyone. If you're uh, asking a question, we'll give you the microphone so that it can be captured and recorded. And I'll just say thank you for an excellent talk and really thought-provoking on um, some of these intersections of what we can and can't do um, in order to treat people. Hey, Doc, hey Dr. Young. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Chinan I'm one of the cardiology fellows. Um, it was a really good talk. I was, I was wondering, do you know... Um, if any research has been done looking at April R1 variants and was potential association to uh, microvascular dysfunction as a potential mechanism to potentiate in kidney disease? That's a great question. And um, I, don't, I don't know if there's, there, there might be, and I haven't looked at a lot of the data, but um, there isn't that associated association with um, diabetes per se and with heart disease. So, you know, maybe looking at some of the microvascular associations, but that's a great question. And um, I, I don't know if it's been shown specifically for sort of microvascular diseases. Um, so something to look at. Definitely. All right. Thank you. And I forgot to show my uh, the kidney disease working group <laughs> um, and my funding. There we so, go. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed your your talk, and I think it really emphasizes how important it is to involve patient groups in in development of of healthcare policies. And um, you, you touched on the the issue that's sort of colloquially known as scared straight that if you know something uh, uh, negative about your health prognosis, that you're going to make lifestyle changes. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that the person who expressed that had pure intent. Um, I, I also wonder about whether that strategy has much to back it up. Um, the, 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 um, uh, I mean, it comes up in cardiology and measuring people's LP little a, or uh, there's nothing you can do about it right now. Right. Um, so I, I'd like your opinion on uh, to, to know whether there is support for for that. Uh, I mean, the, the, you, one finds oneself in the in the situation where people want to know, but they want somebody else to pay for some test. Um, and and so, so 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 this is a, a a bit of an extension, but it would seem to me that the solution to this is the hundred dollar genome, where where you just get it all taken care of up front, right? And and people can inquire later. So it's a two part question. One is is there evidence for scared straight, and two is the solution just the hundred dollar uh, genome sequencing. So those are great questions. So the scared straight, I'll I'll talk to that, you know, from a nephrologist point of view. So as I assume in cardiology, we get folks who are almost at the brink of needing dialysis and they'll say, well, nobody told me that I had kidney disease and what can I do now about it? Um, so I think it, I think that that really requires education. We need to educate everyone um, that people need to take their medications. They need to um, control their blood pressure that, you know, they need to really treat their numbers. I think the one study uh, or sort of a, a a study that showed that if we actually treat how what we know how to treat like diabetes in the Native American population, the incidence of kidney disease actually decreased. 
And uh, as some of you are my age, you probably remember Native Americans had one of the highest risk of kidney disease. Um, it was like 18 fold greater than um, white Americans. And when they, when the Indian Health Service um, or the Indian Health, you know, started to really treat diabetes and added um, nutritionists, they showed that they could decrease the incidence of kidney disease. So I think if we do, you know, and treat the things that we know make a difference, a difference can be made, but whether or not you can scare someone straight, that that's a different question. And I think people need to be educated to know that that's the specific outcome that can happen. Um, and then in your, your question about the, the, you know, million genome, um, I think that we're, we're moving towards that. Um, but there are a lot of genes out there that we, you know, there are genes of unknown significance. So what do we do about those genes? And what do we do about genes that we measure now? And then, you know, 10 years from now or five years from now, we find that they're associated with the disease. How do we go back and tell people about that? So we're, I'm part of the kidney um, precision medicine project, and we're really struggling with that right now about return of genetic results. And you have to let people know that one, you're, you're actually testing and then let people know that they may get these results. And then you have to involve, you know, gen genetic counselors so that people actually get that information and then know what to do about it. Because it's, it, you know, you may test for lots of different genes. Some we know what to do and some we just know they're associated with disease, but a lot we don't know what they mean yet. So I think it's a, a something that we're struggling with now. Yeah, I, I read one from the review article and mentioned that the number of genetic counselors that can be needed to contain everybody experiencing. Exactly. Right. Staggering. The staggering, right. The, yeah. right. Um, counsel them on whether they want the results. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, fascinating uh, presentation. So I'm, I'm really interested in the, the variants that we found in the, in the African American black population in the U.S. versus the East African population and their incidence of end-stage renal disease. So the, it's very interesting that um, sort of in East Africa, those variants aren't found. Um, so for some of those populations, it's probably the story that's similar to like sickle cell disease, where it's probably a it was the geographic isolation. Um, so it's really those um, populations that are in West Africa, um, probably on that side that that have. Yeah, I meant East Africa. If I said West Africa, I'm sorry. But I mean, West Africa I, is what I meant. West, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. oh, in West Africa. Yeah. So that's a good question. And there's ongoing studies looking okay. at kidney disease. Yeah, I misspoke because, yeah. you know, is this a, is a situation where people were brought to the to the United right. States and that environmental impact right. on that genetic background versus right. the people who were remained in, in Africa and are still in Africa. Right, and yeah. there, there are ongoing studies looking at that um, from investigators who have these cohort, uh, there's a cohort study in Africa where they're actually looking at that right okay. now. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. And that really was very fascinating. I'm, I'm wondering if you could sort of comment on some more insights from that stakeholder meeting and also the patient and family meeting in light of Tuskegee and other things that have happened, because it would seem to me on a, on a not so simplistic level, the idea that there would be a test to show that your risk was higher that is being withheld from you sounds an awful lot like at least the early pre-penicillin days of the Tuskegee study if nothing else. And I, I wonder if our kind of clinician orientation of, well, there's there's nothing that we can do, there's nothing that we would do differently, but from the patient perspective, there may be something very much that either, you know, coming up to the line of this is what I can get away with and setting that line back considerably farther, or even, you know what, we got a plan for the future in our family because we someone may up on end up on dialysis. Right. I, I think that that was what was very striking to me as a nephrologist when we were in those groups. People were angry. They were like, you're telling us about this disease and no one has ever. And, and we were doing those studies back in, you know, 2017, 2018. And, and those papers came out in 2010. They were furious. It's like, we want to know, even if we can't do anything about it, 
even if you know we don't change our lifestyle, we want to know because that affects us, it affects our families. And those are families where there are multiple generations that have kidney failure, where multiple people are on dialysis. And again, in the South, where there are dialysis units almost on every corner, like a Starbucks, because there's so much kidney failure, people were very, very angry. Um, and and it just shows that, again, as you said, you know, we um, sort of take the view that we can't treat it. So why should we really test for it and then tell you you have it when we can't do anything about it? But I think people do want to know. And, um, you know, there are a lot of diseases where we don't have any treatment for them, but we really tell people about them. When we had the meeting in Washington, D.C., and we had Martin Pollack, who developed, who actually found the gene come, he sat on in a table with other participants with patients. And he literally got up and, and was crying because he said, you know, this is my research. I didn't realize how much it really affected patients. And he was struck by their passion. Um, and I guess just really points towards we're in our labs or doing our research and we kind of lose that connection with communities. And, and it really sort of brought that back that, that we really are now in a place where we need to involve our communities um, who are affected to help us with the questions and help us move this forward. So now, for example, KPMP, the Kidney Precision Medicine Project, has a, a patient group um, that are helping with all of the aspects of it. So um, when they were thinking about doing kidney biopsies, the patients were like, well, you know, we need insurance. What if something happens? And so now there's insurance uh, just for the patients who are getting these, you know, volunteering to give these biopsies, kidney biopsies. And if something happens, their their health will be taken care of because there's now insurance. So I think we need that voice. Uh, for a long time, we haven't had that voice in the room and all the research that we do. And I think that that's really important. So thank you for ans asking the question. I actually was struck by the same thing. I want to say that two pieces of this. The first is how much I appreciated that the basic science had an immediate and direct connection back to the communities because that's often that <laughs> wherever that lives of translational, make it more circular and bring those together earlier than later. Um, but it also strikes me that it's this funny disconnect. I don't know that everybody noticed that every one of your telephone notes for the last 10 years or whatever is just now being released to all the patients in whom. So in Epic, we have decided that the patients own their health and own their information. And when we do genetic testing, we have a paternalistic, maternalistic attitude that they won't understand it and therefore we should filter it for them. And it's a really interesting sort of paradigm difference, I think, in some of that. And if you, I think it'd be really interesting to look at the difference of community involvement, patient involvement in something like Huntington's, which we all learned in med school. Right. And that was the great dilemma for geneticists of do you tell, do you not tell? And there's entire setups around counseling folks. And that affects a very different group of human beings than, than what you're speaking of here. So I think that, that I'm fascinated by this, this paradigm shift of ownership of your own healthcare information mm -hmm. and the upsides and downsides, uh, particularly like our institutional policy that all your imaging results go straight to the patient before the physician has any chance to interpret it. And that actually does cause an extraordinary amount of distress sometimes. Okay. So there's such that balance there that I find the idea of incorporating that in the basic science, just mm -hmm. fantastic. Right. right. And, and to really bring it to the communities that are most affected and have been most disaffected in the healthcare system, I think is also just fantastic. And we have to educate ourselves. And, you know, so people are going to know that they have some genetic difference and they'll go and look on the web and they'll come to their physician to help them understand it and and we may not understand what it means and so we have to educate ourselves. Dr. Levy and then we'll get some of the uh, chat questions as well. Yeah. On the same topic of you know the clinician side versus uh, the patient side and you know the clinician side thinking that we can't do anything uh, you know uh, with regard um, to this finding. Um, are there studies that look at attenuating that risk um, in high-risk individuals when looking at modifiable risk factors, you know, hypertension, diabetes, things like that, and kind of comparing those two groups, both high-risk, meaning that maybe we can do something as a clinician and on the patient level? So, so we we do need those studies. There was one study that showed, I think, that looked at a hypertension 
clinical trial that showed that if you actually treated hypertension, that there, there was a decrease in the kidney function, um, you know, in development of kidney disease. So those studies, more of those studies need to be done um, because, but it's, it's hard to do because, you know, people develop diabetes and hypertension so early, uh, but it, and you have to follow people for a longer period of time to get at that. We'll take the last few minutes for the folks online so that we're truly yeah. incorporating both, both ends here. Of, yeah. Uh, online. Uh, the first question is, says, thank you for a great talk. Have you seen or been involved in any successful efforts to address the social determinants of kidney disease through policy or structural change? That's a great question. So um, I, you know, I, I do what what I can. So we have health fairs to try to get people tested for, you know, some of the risk factors for kidney disease, but there have been um, some, you know, changes um, like in kidney transplant, some of the, the variables for kidney transplant have changed, which have actually changed whether or not a person gets a kidney transplant. So for example, um, it used to be that you had to be worked up for a kidney transplant and then you got put on the list. But now for, for kidney failure, once you start dialysis, you actually start to gain time on the list. So that actually helps, um, you know, Blacks and African-Americans because they are on the list for a long period of time. They start dialysis earlier. Um, so, so that's one policy change that has actually made a difference. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, they said, really interesting talk, thank you. How did you all how did you all weigh the seemingly different opinions of researchers, clinicians, and the patients in formulating the position statement? So how did we sort of integrate? I missed the Yeah, I think it was the how did you balance balance the, oh, yeah. okay. between the share it yeah. and share it. The different yeah. so so that was a that was a that's a great question. And that's why we had that stakeholder, that final um, meeting where we actually like presented to the, the data. We had small groups, we had people discuss, and then we actually discussed, well, what should be our final clinical recommendations? And, and this, um, and so we had people actually vote on what they should be, and we sent that back out to the all of the stakeholder groups, which included researchers and, and patients and communities and families and, and some of the policymakers, and, and that that's how we did that. So we, it was a conversation amongst all the stakeholders. We, we gathered the information, and then presented it to this large stakeholder group and then came up with those recommendations. Um, and that person also had a follow-up question. Have people encountered challenges related to patients getting health or life insurance, as you mentioned briefly? So I, I think that's a great question. And, um, you know, for kidney disease, we're, we're lucky in that it's something that we have to, as a society have decided that we will pay for, but we only pay for in-stage renal disease. So people actually have to go on dialysis before, um, before they actually have their health care paid for. So just imagine if we could actually pay for primary care, how many, how many people on dialysis would that prevent? Um, so that's what we need to really work towards is that, you know, health care is something that it's a right. Everybody should have it. We need to prevent disease, which would help our, you know, national budget because we wouldn't be paying all of that money for people going on dialysis. And look, you have one more question on there, on the chat? Yeah. Okay, great. Perfect timing then. Thanks thank so much you. for the folks who showed up in person. Thank, thank you for you. everybody who's online. And thank you, Dr. Young. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so,